Hello there and welcome to today's webinar, Mapping Patient Journey Pain Points to Predict Net Promoter Score. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the CEO of Adoreboard. And Adoreboard uh, quantifies uh, emotion and we work with HealthScope. And today I'm very pleased to introduce you to Jeffrey Woods. Welcome, Jeffrey. So hey, Jeffrey hello. is going to <laughs> Jeffrey's going to be our guest speaker for the next 45 minutes. Um, just to remind you that uh, today's webinar will last for around 45 minutes. You get a copy of the recording of the webinar, so you ensure your colleagues after. And also you get access to the Emotix platform to enable you to um, test and to analyze some uh, verbatim from your patient comments. Um, so let's get started. And uh, throughout the webinar, you can use the chat function to ask any questions or you can uh, use Q&A. Uh, we're going to allow for some uh, questions and answers. Um, so as I said, very pleased uh, for Jeffrey to join us. Jeffrey is uh, a customer experience leader, having uh, been with HealthScope for the last two and a half years as their uh, national patient experience manager. And um, he's got over a decade of experience, having also spent some time working in the US, one of the words at leading hospitals are. Uh, so welcome, Jeffrey. Hi, welcome. It's going to be fun. Uh, yes, yeah, it's going to be fun. So, uh, and as I say, my name is Chris Johnson and I'm the CEO of Adorboard. So I, I just want to get started by uh, summarizing what I find is a really fascinating story um, of HealthScope um, and the journey that um, Jeffrey uh, has led his team in, in in really transforming how they approach uh, patient experience. And we're kind of putting this story into kind of three chapters. And the first chapter you'll you'll hear about is really um, what we what we all experience when we're thinking about analyzing um, patient responses. There's the collection and manual uh, analyzing of the responses. And Jeffrey's gonna talk to us about the analog approach before they move to the digital. And then from digital, um, what I think is really fascinating um, about HealthScope is that they're looking to prioritize the action that they take based on patient emotion. And if you think about the customer experience maturity curve, you know, people start off, you know, dabbling in customer experience and, you know, moving towards a digital approach. Um, but wh where I see HealthScope is really leading in this area. So you're going to hear a lot of great best practice today. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Jeffrey um, to go over um, a bit about HealthScope. All right. So do we want to jump to the next slide? Sure. Thank you. So HealthScope is uh, Australia's second largest uh, private hospital operator. So we have 43 hospitals, uh, over 5,000 beds across Australia. Uh, most of our hospitals are centrally located, but we have at least one hospital in every state or territory. And we run the gamut from mental health, acute care to rehabilitation. Um, and we're very fortunate to have 18,000 wonderful employees that help us deliver exceptional care across this nation. Um, and uh, we also have pathology operations in New Zealand as well. Although they've never invited me there, so I don't talk about them too much. <laughs> so I think as Chris talked a, a little bit when he introduced me, when I started in this role, we were very new into transitioning from a paper base to a uh, electronic survey. And one of the drivers for us to change and actually start capturing better data with our patient experience was really two core things. There were some internal drivers and externally. So internally, um, we're highly competitive, so we, we pay attention to what's going on with our peers. Um, and we generally had historically low satisfaction scores. We are also a really large uh, health system, 45, 43 hospitals, all of them unique and special in their own way. So we did have inconsistency uh, in practices um, and some in, in inefficiencies and variations. So we had a great opportunity to improve the way we delivered care and our customer service. Um, in Australia, we're just starting this journey of really embracing and engaging patient experience. Um, and so that new wave of support for that was a really key driver for us to actually try take the first step to become leaders in this area in Australia. 
Um, and then of course, you know, we're a healthcare company. So our two favorite things are a complicated process and paperwork. Um, and the only thing better than one form is three form, especially if they all tell you the same thing. So we uh, did a lot of work around uh, removing some of that. Externally, patient expectations, we're a private organization. Australia has a public system and a private system. Our public system is very large and that's free to all Australian uh, citizens and residents. Um, private is, you know, we pay private health funds and then private health funds pay for this. It costs quite a lot of money. So people's expectations, if I'm forking out thousands and thousands of dollars a year to, uh, for health cover, when I go to that hospital, my expectation on return on investment is very high. And we weren't always meeting that expectation. Uh, as I said before, uh, patient satisfaction scores were lower than our peers. Um, and as a competitive company, that wasn't something we were proud of. There were, is a lot of pressure um, and continues to be a lot of pressure for us to differentiate the benefits between public and private, uh, but at a tangible level for patients. So while patients are interested in quality, um, they're not really going to experience that until they actually have surgery or engage with uh, the private health system. Um, and so how do we differentiate? How do we prove, deliver better outcomes and justify our premiums? And why should a patient pick to go to a private hospital versus a public hospital where literally everything is free? Um, and so it gave us a great opportunity to assume a leadership position and also start to really differentiate what they can expect between those two, two experiences. Uh, so how did we do this? Oh, Good Lord, this was a long journey. So <laughs> in fact, we actually started our journey to electronic really in early 2017. We dabbled with it like mid to late 2017. In January 2018, we just went big bang. We literally transitioned all 43 hospitals from a paper based process. As I like to call it, we ditched the 90s um, and moved everyone to an electronic system. Our uh, partner for that is Qualtrics uh, for the delivery of our survey system. And then we use uh, a door board for understanding what our patients are actually telling us. Um, what we noticed when we transitioned, we were, uh, when I say paper-based, I kid you not, we handed out physical paper surveys to patients, got them back, manually put them into an Excel spreadsheet, printed that Excel spreadsheet off and took it to a meeting, uh, made beautiful graphs and put them somewhere that nobody looked at. Um, and so we got rid of that. We went fully electronic. We now survey every patient discharged from a healthscope hospital. Um, we send them out that survey the week after their discharge. Um, so we get real-time feedback very quickly. We, uh, as of today, we have had 170,000 responses uh, to our survey. Uh, and we only started doing it in January, 2018. So we have about a 38% response rate to our survey at the moment. Um, we survey everyone <laughs> um, that is an inpatient. We do both mental health um, and non-mental health patients. Um, and then we also looked at the way we deliver care, the, our person-centered care strategy. And there was a lot of variation from that. So we brought in what we like to call flexible standardization. Uh, we took our person-centered care strategies. We took that with what we internally call patient truth, which is our patient feedback. That's our patient feedback. Coupled that with a quality improvement process. Um, and we call that strategy back to bedside. So it's made up of rework, which is the quality improvement. That is all about our staff. That is how do we save our staff time? How do we free them up to take care of our patients? Uh, element two is always events. That is all about the patient. Five key behaviors that will most improve our patient's experience. We did not invent the wheel here. We, we took what were best practices from around the world and created the five based on our patient feedback would have the most impact. And then the third element is a feedback loop. And well, that's just a really nice way of saying that we're watching you. Um, and we actually track on the back end. So we use patient truth. Every meeting at HealthScope starts with a patient truth. That is a comment from our patient experience survey. Um, we have two core measures, which I'll talk about shortly, but every, every member from our frontline to senior ex executive know what those two core measures are and can articulate that for their area. Um, so using this real-time feedback, we track two metrics. That's, well, we, that's a lie. We actually track like 36 other ones, but we only actually talk about two, and that is overall rating of treatment and care. 
and a net promoter score. Now we use a patient experience survey, not a patient satisfaction survey. So we're really asking them, did they experience the, event, the events we're asking them about? So overall, the quality of treatment and care I received was versus how happy were you with the quality and treatment and care? Um, as of today, our overall rating of treatment and care is 89%. Um, and we use a best practice survey for that, which is the Australian Hospital Patient Experience Question Set. That's a 12 question survey. Um, and our net promoter score or would recommend score currently sits at 83.1. To put this all into perspective, when we started this journey um, in paper, our overall rating of treatment and care sat around the 65 to 69%. Um, and our net promoter score well, we're not going to talk about where that was. It's much better now. <laughs> um, let's not talk about the past. Um, I think, although as much as we've loved the journey and, and staff embraced this data, and um, what we found is shifting from paper to electronic was comments. In paper, we didn't get comments. In uh, electronic system, we got this on tsunami, tsunami of comments that come through for us. Um, and we average about 7,000 plus survey responses a month. Um, and 90% of those will have a comment. Some of them are, a, you know, one line comment, you're awesome. Um, or you suck. Oh, 50, it's 50, 50 there. Um, but some of them are Jane Austen novel and a large portion of them are there. And within that novel is just golden nuggets of truth that are really hard for us to find and, and make sense of. Um, and so we use a doorboard to support us with really understanding the emotional context behind what our patients are telling us so we can understand what's important to them. Super. And I suppose, Jeffrey, um, the reason why you think about emotion is that 80% of decisions that are made by people in everyday life are driven by emotion. I, I would love to just hear what emotion means to the frontline clinicians when you're trying to tell that story about moving from you know thinking about patients as numbers to thinking them ab yeah. about them as people so yeah. how does emotion bring that to, to life so i think the you know uh, um simplest thing i because we talk about this all the time internally there's a big difference between if i was doing customer service in um a retail store even though there's some emotion behind that, the emotional intensity and emotional context behind it is a lot different when I'm in a healthcare setting because uh, our patients are already scared, frightened, nervous, and, and whatever, and then we're getting this feedback. I think what we learned early on talking to staff going, you know, your overall rating of care is this. They're like, okay, well, that's great. What does that mean? Do they like me? Um, you know, and, and trying to put context around that data point and what does that mean as a human being so when we uh, uh looked into a door board and, and engaged with a door board um that's where we saw the switch happen because all of a sudden we were sharing data with them now that said well your patient said their this ex particular experience for them left them feeling you know disgust or fear or or hate and we can all relate to these emotions because we have a personal connection with those. Um, or, you know, they left feeling happy, joy, ecstasy. Um, and now I can understand, oh, that's how I made them feel. Yeah. Otherwise, you're as horrible as it sounds, as a nurse or a frontline staff, I look after lots and lots of people. But, you know, at some point it just becomes one big patient. And until I understand what was the emotional impact of what I did, because when you're talking about care, care is about empathy and compassion. Um, and realistically, we're human beings looking after human beings and human beings are emotional things. We're emotional beings. We're purely driven by emotion. We pretend we're not, but we are. And so to make that connection for frontline staff, we found it was incredibly powerful to share with them uh, data in those words and then be able to show them little snippets of a comment that drove that, that, that emotional feeling of, of distress or disgust or, or, or ecstasy and then showing them. And when that patient said they, they, it was ecstasy, it was because, you know, nurse Jenny sat and held my hand while I was crying and then 
she took walked with me when I went to the x-ray and talked me through the whole procedure and, and all of these sorts of stuff. And it takes it from a data, data, data uh, element to a personal human element that we can all easily understand. Um, generally speaking, frontline staff don't really care about data. They yeah. care about people. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and just to introduce everyone to the idea of emotion, um, the framework that um, Jeffrey has been talking about is Plutchik's Wheel of Emotion. And it's really important to think about, do you want to see your patients in black and white or do you want to see them in high definition? And this model allows you to think about um, the fact that emotion isn't static, that it's actually based on intensity. So this model um, was uh, developed by a eminent uh, American psychologist and uh, known as Plutchik. This is known as Plutchik's Wheel of Emotion. And essentially what he is saying is that emotion isn't static, that it moves about. And you can see here um, in the outer la label, it uh, is low intensity emotions like annoyance that moves to medium intensity, which is anger to then um, higher intensity emotions. And all these inner emotions um, that you can see in the center are what's known as high intensity emotions. The great thing about this is that you can actually um, recover an experience before it actually happens. And, and the idea of these high intensity emotions are actually linked to action tendencies. So for example, um, you know, if people are, you know, angry about the food, the, the action for the patient is actually not to eat the food, which is not great for, for the patient. Um, so it's actually trying to bring it back to the patient to actually say, okay, what are the potential actions that could occur? And obviously for, for Jeff, from Jeffrey's perspective, they, they actually they have choice, so they won't actually return. So they have a moment of truth to really define, uh, you know, how patients are feeling to, to do something about it. The second thing is that these emotions are opposite, so you can actually design experiences to target and to um, move people from a current experience to uh, a new experience. So you can see sadness is the opposite of joy. So if your patients are feeling sad, you can then target new experiences to then improve that. Um, and what we have done as a software company is um, been able to codify this idea of emotion, but also put themes against this. And what this um, gives Jeffrey is the ability to go from a raw and structured data to a business answer. Um, and if we are to think about the three steps, the first step is to integrate the data. So Jeffrey thinking about what, what are all the various touch points that we can incorporate? And that's not just Qualtrics, it could be social comments left on mm -hmm. social media or forums. And what we're doing is we're linking emotional intensity to a theme. And we're gonna hear about some of the business impact um, for that. So in, in trying to bring this to life, I, I thought we for a second should step outside the health um, sector for a second. So as I explain the three steps, I, I'm gonna give you a reference point it just brings it to life for, for an everyday um, experience. So as I say, think about all of those different touch points um, that you get from patients. Um, once you um, upload and integrate that data into your platform from Qualtrics, um, what you get is the ability to um, measure that. Um, so you have the ability to um, get a score and to um, see how that score uh, defines the experience. So you can see here that uh, we provide an overall metric called the ADORE score on an index of minus 100 to plus 100. And when we correlated this to HealthScope's uh, Net Promoter Score, there's actually a very strong correlation. So when Jeffrey looks at our dashboard, he has confidence that the metrics that he's seeing in the dashboard actually link back to the Net Promoter Score. So this example is for Apple, and you're probably wondering, well, why is Apple minus 72? So we can look at joy and see what people love, and we can see that people love going into the Genius Bar to get a great employee experience. Um, but that doesn't really explain the minus 72. So it turns out that people hate getting emoji keyboard updates when they just want the battery and the charger fix. So Apple, go fix the battery and the charger. So this is a, an ability to almost do um, root cause analysis in real time. And just to give you an example, and, and for a lot of, of people working in uh, customer experience, what you're trying to do is 
as, as Jeffrey say, what, what is the golden nugget that sparks a new narrative about the experience that you want to create? So a lot of the times you want to go from an unknown to an outcome for the patient. And we all know, and, and Jeffrey will um, refer to this, is that there's, there's over 55 academic studies um, of primary care and they, they've been able to find the positive association between patient experience and patient safety and the clinical effectiveness um, of treating disease. So the link between patient experience and patient outcome is, is really um, uh, critical. Um, so just to kind of think about this um, outside of the um, healthcare profession, just so that you get a context, uh, this example is for a customer of a doorboard um, fashion retailer. So they analyzed 4 million uh, data points around their store experience. So think about store as in hospital. And what they found was that um, anger and rage was emanating from the changing rooms and people were scratching their heads going, well, what is it about our changing rooms that, that people hate? And the theme of lighting and mirrors came up. Um, and again, people were going, well, what, what on earth is wrong with the lighting and mirrors? And when we um, saw the link from the emotion to the verbatim, we could see that people were saying, your lighting and mirrors are like cellulite detection devices from outer space. So people were going into the changing room, getting a fright and going straight out. And as a result, abandoning purchase. Um, so we actually saw uh, Instagram photos of muscle men um, share photos because the lighting was so good that it was almost like professional <laughs> photography. But for the average Joe, they were, they were built in out of the changing rooms like uh, scalded cats. Um, so my, my real point here is that the board were really surprised by this insight because they had invested millions of pounds upgrading the overall store experience, putting in these real funky um, unisex changing rooms with these really cool um, mirrors that put people off. And I think the key takeaway, and we'll, we'll talk about it in some of the examples that Jeffrey it's sometimes the, the small things that cause high intense emotions that if you can fix that right, that can actually magnify the experience for the other people. So the brave people that have said, geez, your changing rooms are really bad. Um, you know, that, that could actually um, change it for all the people who, who haven't said that. Um, so the, the other key takeaway is change the lighting in the mirrors. You can then target in this case, reduce churn at the changing rooms by 25%. So there are the three steps, integrate the data, understand what drives the emotions, and then apply decision-ready insights. Jeffrey, before we go into some of the examples, is there any other comments just from, from what um, we've just talked about in so, the broader? Yeah, I think the, the only other thing I would say, and this is how our, we're starting to learn this, is the power behind that emotion is emotion drives loyalty. Um, uh, to a brand, whether it's a hospital or not, uh, that it's really driven by emotions. So if we don't understand the emotional intensity and the emotions behind what our patients are telling us, we're missing a great opportunity to build that loyalty and that trust and that brand reputation. Because at the end of the day, um, we're pretty much, even in healthcare, healthcare is a commodity. We're all doing uh, laparoscopic surgery. You're your appendectomy, doesn't matter who's doing it, if an appendectomy is an appendectomy. What is gonna be the difference behind that is the service and the way we make people feel um, that's gonna drive that loyalty and understanding what they, they really want. Um, and I will tell you this, they go, we love brand new hospitals and we built a brand new hospital recently opened it. Absolutely loved it, it was amazing. We got so many complaints about the car park. And, and, and that dragged down all of the great clinical work, all of, the beautiful building because the car park drove people crazy um, and they had, were having trouble just paying. Um, and we learned very quickly on the power of validating parking. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, we're so sorry you got stuck here, it's free parking. Oh, you, you, you know, I could cut off your right arm if I gave you free parking, they were happy with that now. But that's how annoying it was for them. And so, uh, you know, using a door board to drive this sort of, we wouldn't have picked that up. I, I and think we were, Jeff, we're focusing on overall rating going, why is the hospital not doing well? Because they're telling us the nurses are wonderful. They're telling us the care is great. But it was the car park that was the pain point. And if you think about it, that's the first thing and the last thing they see. It's a, it's a great example. Um, maybe then just to talk through, um, you know, how we then link MPS to emotional intensity. 
and I'm happy to jump in here, but Jeffrey, you, you, you know. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so, so in, in, in looking at um, the Net Promoter Score, and you can see that the context to the Net Promoter Score for HealthScope is that it's a really strong score already. So, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you think about, you know, going to, you know, above 83? You know, obviously that's a, a core objective for Jeffrey and his team, but um, it's really about then thinking about incremental improvements. Um, how can you solve the small things in the moment across the patient journey to then almost optimize the overall experience? And what we did was we, we looked at um, the last year's data for HealthScope and we then um, started to see, could we get a correlation between the ADORE score and some of the emotions as it relates to the MPS? And with that insight, could we then predict if we solve some of the issues for HealthScope? Um, you know, would that actually improve the net promoter score? So you can see, yes, go ahead, Jeffrey. No, I was going to say, and it, you know, the, the, the reason this is so powerful for us is that we had such a tremendous improvement when we first started with the shift and the launch of Back to Bedside. We made tremendous insights, but we're getting to that point now where, okay, we've solved all the, 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 the low-hanging fruit problems, the, the quick, quick wins, quick fixes. Well, um, but now we have to dig a little deeper and our hospitals are hungry for being able to get down to down into the weeds and really understand it because now it's not going to be big shifts. It's going to be these little incremental shifts and in tackling key problems that is going to keep pushing us forward. Excellent. And, and I think, you know, what, if you're just to purely look at, at the data here, you can see that there's a 0.74 correlation between the ADORE score, which is that overall emotional score with the NPS. And you can see here that, uh, for example, um, if, the disgust increases. So if patient disgust increases and there's strong correlation, NPS will decrease. So there's a negative correlation. Similarly with fear, uh, strong correlation. If, um, if fear goes up, NPS goes down. Um, we can see that if joy goes up, that um, the NPS goes up as well. So that's just giving you a context to, to what we'll see next. Um, so in looking at this, um, the uh, and Jeffrey, please jump in. Um, we, we were looking at um, how could we solve um, issues for groups of uh, customers, patients with similar issues. And um, Jeffrey can add color to this, but the idea is <laughs> that we can, we can now um, actually name the patients. So it's not just a, a percentage, it's actually we can name who the patients are that are having the, the issues. And I think, again, that humanizes actually the action that galvanizes from this. So 46 patients um, were having issues with blood pressure. So interestingly, when the nurses were fitting the blood pressure cuffs, that um, because they're fitting, uh, fitting it too tightly, it was actually leaving uh, bruise marks with the patients and they were finding uh, uh, real discomfort with that. Yeah. And based I on that, Yep. Yeah, just with this, I mean, when Chris first showed us this data, you know, um, we looked at it because we, we track our comments and we look at the comments, but it's really hard. So we, we, we scan and we, we look for themes and we use word clouds to group things. So when blood pressure turns up for us, we're looking at the clinical part of blood pressure, such as their blood pressure, they had a hypertensive episode. We didn't manage the clinical care part of it. And it turns out it's actually not the clinical care part. It's the mechanical part. Uh, it's the actual task of taking a blood pressure. Um, and so I was quite surprised, you know, and this is the devil in the detail. If we had to just move forward with how we anticipated, we would have built a whole process around managing high blood pressure, low blood pressure, uh, and symptomatic patients and clinical pathways to try and solve this problem. But that wasn't the actual problem. The actual problem was the, the distress and the pain caused by the blood pressure cuff and the impact that had on, on, on trust and the patient's trusting. And if you think about it, if a nurse is putting a, a blood pressure cuff on me and it's hurting me, um, I'm not going to be very trusting of that person to be kind to me or, you know, or they're not going to hurt me moving forward. Because if they can't get something as simple as my blood pressure right, 
um, you know, how can I trust them with, gosh forbid, they bring in a needle and want to jab me with that. Yeah. Blood pressure cuff her, don't bring the needle in. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you're not, we're, you know, it, it's these little things that erode. And I think that was the power of between looking at the emotion context behind and that, that really, when you show this to a nurse and you go, okay, wow, I wouldn't have put that my blood pressure cuff would have broken trust because it hurt because, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. Don't worry. Well, you know, we use soothing words, but that doesn't solve the problem of build trust. Same with yeah. waiting rooms. We knew waiting rooms were a problem. Who knew waiting rooms actually made people angry? <laughs> we knew it frustrated them and it annoyed them because I had to wait. But all of a sudden we're seeing this rise and, you know, anger. And then when we looked at that, we drilled down into that, you know, it wasn't the actual waiting room. So we were looking at the waiting room, how we make them prettier. How do we make them bigger? How do, do we put a bigger TV in? What about a fish tank? What about if we put some lights on the walls? You know, maybe some kind of light show, whatever, art feature. That wouldn't have solved the problem because when we draw down into those comments, their experiences around, you came in at six o'clock in the morning, we stripped you off your clothes, put you in a gown, sat you in a waiting room, took away all your devices and technology to essentially cut you off from the world and sat you in a room full of strangers. So it's not the environment, but really some of the, the tasks around it. And realistically, do we have to take away their phone while they're waiting? we can actually take that away just as they roll into the pre-op area and then we can secure that device for them for when they come back. I, I think it w what's really interesting. Sorry, I took that away from you. <laughs> uh, I, no, and Jeffrey, what, what's, what's fascinating is, you know, you talk about hard problems and soft problems and the hard problems are infrastructure. You know, it's really hard to rebuild the hospital, right? You know, if people are complaining yeah. about, you know, yeah. The, the aesthetics, whereas these softer problems are actually things that you can action, you can actually do something about them uh, today. And these are low, co low cost, easy to do, quick wins, as we like to call them. I think we, you know, and I, I, universally we have a problem with legacy hospitals. So we have a large number of our hospitals that, that have been around for many, many years. Um, and they're going through their renovation process. So renovations create just as many problems and just as much frustration for patients. And the thing is, as soon as we update a hospital, you know, it's out of date already because technology's changed, aesthetics have changed, you know, and so it's a losing battle to fight, trying to build the best and the brightest and the newest, when that's not necessarily the problem to start with. The problem is these soft problems where we're taking, I caused you pain which broke trust, something that was, you know, a blood pressure cuff is a dollar versus yeah. three million dollars to renovate a wedding room <laughs> right yeah. or, or you know uh, giving you your phone that you paid for and that you own is much cheaper than me spending ten thousand dollars on a beautiful life light art fixture and a tv that i'm then going to make you watch the food network on while you're not allowed to eat uh so you know the, without knowing this we would have gone down a wrong path and and what spent money we didn't necessarily wouldn't have got us to the outcome in the first place and, and i think you know this allows you to prioritize by emotional intensity but then you're also yeah. thinking about the outcome so 46 patients potential 18 percent increase in your mps you know it makes it makes a an easy business case to say well hey let's let's relook at the blood pressure cuffs and similarly with the waiting rooms you know empowering um uh, patients to feel more comfortable, you know, where they can get changed yeah. into their own clothes while they're waiting or have their device to remain connected to their loved ones whilst they're yeah. you know, before and after. Um, not only solves that for the individual, but gives um, the overall experience a 16% increase in the net promoter score. I yeah. think and If you that, think about that device, it's just giving them back a yeah. sense of control as well, which is incredibly powerful for patients because it's the one thing we take away. Yep. So I think that um, they're kind of the kind of ideas of, you know, things that you can solve and then you have COVID <laughs> and, and, and things. <laughs> what? What's this COVID <laughs> thing? And, and, and things fundly, um, fundamentally change from, um, you know, operating as normal from a private hospital to now working with the government to to make the hospital accessible to the public. So it might be useful in the context of um, thinking about COVID as, as a way to yep. um, 
you know, think about how you deliver experience. What I was fascinated by is that um, appreciation for staff, this halo effect of how people respect uh, the healthcare. You can see the straight line from the start of, start of COVID to, to the, yeah. the, the lockdown being eased. Yeah, and I mean, you know, when when COVID came along, you obviously, just like every other health system across the world, we rallied and we changed. The, we went into pandemic uh, operational mode rather than business as usual. And we internally actually expected to see a significant impact um, based on this and the change in operating and, and all of the fear and the anxiety around that was driven out of the media around this virus that that's killing hundreds of millions of people, yada, yada, yada. And so it was really interesting as we watched our data that we didn't see that and we did see, and we get a lot of appreciation for our staff and we actually use that for reward and recognition as a secondary process within our always events for nurse managers uh, and leaders. But what we saw with this is that healthcare heroes, just this, this for the first time in a, in, in a long time, you know, doctors get all the glory because I have TV shows about them. Every other healthcare worker doesn't. Uh, so for once we saw the shift where healthcare workers in general were suddenly being valued for the things we do every day. I mean, we every day we follow infection control. Every day we wear personal protective equipment when caring for you know patients that have an infection and things like that. But all of a sudden this was thrust into the limelight and now they do see that, that our staff are on the front lines when it comes to you know, catastrophic pandemics like this and, 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 and things, you know, even, I mean, our staff goes through this every day in an, in an emergency department, let's be honest. But it wasn't until there was such a global impact that it threw the limelight on them. And it was just really appreciated, uh, great to see and, and, and be able to share with staff. It was just really good to share with staff where patients were like, even with everything that's going on, you were still there and you still did this and you, you were still wonderful. Um, and it was really heartening. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding because you've increased your MPS by 2.5% um, since since the last uh, survey. But I, I, I think that what's interesting is as a customer experience um, professionals, you were still solving problems for patients yeah. throughout this period. Um, and we can interestingly see that whilst, you know, we can see this appreciation go up, we can still see that apprehension um, you know, the start of lockdown yeah. was, I think, the 12th of March in Australia, and then it lifted yep. um, just on the 12th of May. And you can actually see this is based on all of the um, analysis of surveys from February to the end of May. And you can see, yeah. you can just follow your eye, you know, the control process, which is the red dotted line, anything below that is um, identifying anything significant. And you can see that apprehension uh, increased by uh, 34%. So I suppose that's what the context that as customer experience professionals you were having to deal with in terms of what are the things that we could actually change. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, that's a key thing. And I mean, when we went into lockdown, we, you know, took away visit. There were no visitors there. We, you know, we started to isolate our patient populations, particularly our elderly patient populations in our rehab hospitals. So it's not surprising to see, you know, apprehension was elevated across the community. I mean, in Australia, we were panicked buying toilet paper, like, yes. like dysentery was the outbreak. Um, yes. <laughs> and then, so it was, it just validates some of the things we were doing. And then it helped us make sense of what we were hearing from our patients. I, I think what's interesting is that overall, so this was comparing the previous year to the COVID, um, the COVID period that we did see obviously a 23% reduction in joy. There was an eroding of trust, 7.5%, um, and then a 28% increase in sadness. And I think when you, when you look at that, um, you can see that some of the concerns were related to COVID. So it wasn't yep. anything that the hospital was doing, it was actually the, the, the context in which um, the healthcare professionals found themselves. Yep. Um, and it yeah, totally. And I think, it, you know, and, uh, you know, even though we didn't, you know, it wasn't really related care, it was related to COVID, these are still, this was still incredibly powerful information 
for us because you know if you're just looking at these comments i mean you can see the clear supply issue around hand sanitizer hand, you know just like the rest of the world we struggled in australia to get uh hand sanitizer ppe uh and all this other stuff and so you can actually see this but what was really great is all of a sudden um, rather than just us internally monitoring ourselves, our patients actually became advocates for for safety and were able to identify um, uh, areas of concern or areas we need to look at. But it also identified if, uh, you know, the uh, area of improvement, this comment around elevators, uh, putting check-in stations at our elevators. If we had to put our COVID check or screening station at the elevator, that patient would have already walked through a quarter of our building to get to the elevator because our elevator bays are generally towards the middle of most of our buildings um, so they would have come through the main lobby and the main waiting area and cafeteria and parts of our hospital which if they had some kind of infection is a little late so we actually had them at the very front door but what we learned from this is clearly we're not communicating uh, in, in a clear manner the steps we're taking for safety. And that's what that showed us. And, and how do we better communicate that to our patients and our visitors so that they understand this is why it's here, um, but that you know there are other processes further down the line. I, I think the, the obvious one is you know the seating arrangements in the waiting area before you go and see the doctor, but yeah. who knew navigating through the hospital would be uh, the, the key area for improvement? Yeah. You know, people yeah. concerned about getting into the lift with others, people concerned about yeah. waiting for the lift to arrive, or if the lift yeah. is not working, that that creates a bottleneck, yeah. and the fact that hand sanitizer may yeah. or may not be available there. Available. Um, yeah, and I mean, was, we had issues. Yeah, people stole our hand sanitizer. People are stealing our hand sanitizer. So, yeah. you know, we actually internally had to take steps to protect and preserve PPE and make sure that there was a hand sanitizer available. So we, we had to put them at, at, at staffed areas where they couldn't be stolen. Uh, and I'm not kidding you, we have them wall mounted units. People pop that open and stole the sack of sanitizer out of it. Um, but your point around queuing, so you know, there was concern around elevators and we implemented social distancing. So we had to restrict elevator access. So there's all these signs, you know, one person per elevator, depending on the size of the elevator. Um, but then that causes this bottleneck. And then we initially didn't have signs on the floor for the elevator because we didn't anticipate that to be an issue. And then it was like, oh, okay, we need to put some clear markings to make sure they're not backing up into the other areas and that people are still able to socially distance without obstructing fire exits and, and other other egresses and so that create you know that was another eye-opening um opportunity for us and then of course you know uh we wouldn't have known that if our patients hadn't and visitors hadn't have shared that feedback I, I suppose that that's maybe something i know you're you're taking taken from this you know how can we leverage our patients to almost yeah. be be the intelligence on the ground for yeah. and and that and that puts the the patients in a more collaborative uh, approach as yeah. opposed to um, you know I have to complain. Um, so yeah, I and think best advocate is the patient. Yes, yes. I, I, it'd be interesting just to get your thoughts on on this this issue of signage and the fact that it drove. Uh, nearly 7% of all COVID mentions uh, drove apprehension by 20% yep. and sadness by 30%. Ah, oh, signs. Ah, uh, <laughs> so signs, we like to make signs like we make paperwork, very wordy. <laughs> um, and not always very clear. The other thing with signage as well, um, you know, when we first went into this, the, the quickest and the fastest signs we could make were English, being English speaking. Um, but not all of our patients speak English. And so we had beautiful signs all in English. Um, so if you spoke English or you were with someone that spoke English, it was super easy to get around. As soon as a non-English speaking patient came along, that's where we, we, we they ran into issues. The other thing is not that we were ignoring that patient population, but translation took time. So all of a sudden, everyone in Australia, every company in Australia was trying to translate something. And so it was took us anywhere from a week to a week and a half just to get translations done. 
um, by certified translators because we couldn't use anything else being a healthcare company. Um, and then that had to get go through consumer approval and then get implemented. So something that in normal world would be quite quick for us to turn around suddenly took three to four weeks for us to get a sign. And it wasn't just us, um, even the public system, was, uh, our public system was struggling with translation and getting translated documents. The other thing was that if, you know, when COVID first broke out, the information changed so rapidly, we couldn't keep up with the changing information and, and just, just keeping up signs. I, uh, during the height of it, I think here in Australia, and we've been very lucky comparably. Um, we were changing things three times, four times a day. Um, and so with 43 hospitals, we would create a sign, to get it made, to the, get it to the printing company. Printing company prints, distributes, and then we're like, don't put that sign up now. Here's the new version of it. No, don't put that one up now. Here's the newer version of it. And so it, it very quickly got quite challenging to manage signage, but without it, our patients didn't understand what we were doing or where they needed to go or how they kept safe. So we have to start getting a little innovative with that. I, I think, uh, and, and we'll talk about the innovation in, in a second, I think that if you, if you can quantify the emotion that the patient um, feels and that prompts an action, I thought that the action that you actually took was addressing it was personalizing the, the, the problem uh, and solving it. So if you can maybe just speak to this as I provide, you know, the visuals of what this is. <laughs> so we, <laughs> so we, you know, signs are, are great and, and we had to, you know, we needed to, to personalize it and get it down to the people that needed to see it and not just, you know, and I always use this as my example people don't go anywhere to read signs. And we know that's true because they will walk into a building, stand right next to the sign and still ask someone where the elevator is. Um, so what we did is we, and I'm just gonna be honest, I eat McDonald's, McDonald's puts <laughs> place mat tray things down. We stole that idea shamelessly. And what you see here is a placemat that went onto the meal tray for every patient. And so each hospital identified whether it was breakfast, lunch or dinner, um, but every day, one meal service went out with this tray to make sure that we captured existing and then any new patients. Um, and this trans, this placemat was translated into five different languages, uh, five main languages we have across our hospitals, um, as well as some supplementary ones for uh, uh, additional patients that we wouldn't normally see. But um, the pandemic really did change our whole patient population for us. I think, uh, again, you know, reflecting on, you know, do we build a new hospital or do we actually solve problems yep. for patients? And I think all the examples you've taken us through, Jeffrey, are all about let's solve it for the patients in the moment. And, and yep. you can see that uh, translating in the net promoter score 2.5 increase. Yep. Um, so can maybe just get your, your thoughts about the journey? You know, we, we started thinking about the journey in those three stages. What are your takeaways for people who are either at the start of that maturity curve of customer experience or, or wanting yeah. to upgrade their experience, their experience framework? So, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, the other thing I'd just say, if we had still been a paper process for patient experience, we wouldn't have had to do it because we stopped Handing, we couldn't hand out paper and get paper back from an infection right. control risk. Yeah. Uh, so that became that. So that's just you know a, a fundamental thing that would have shifted for us. But it, it's such a cumbersome and it's very labor intensive and it's very expensive. My my honest advice: if you're thinking of going electronic, just do it. Just jump in, embrace it uh, wholeheartedly. Um, is it, are you going to have bumps? Yes. If you want to hear war stories, happy to share <laughs> things we don't talk about publicly um, because there are pain points and there are, there are, there is a learning curve, but if you, you pick a good partner that, uh, to, to work with uh, Qualtrics, a door board, they will be there to guide you every step of the way. I will tell you this. I worked in the U S uh, um, and we do patient experience. In, I worked in California at the hospital I worked there. As a nurse manager there, 
we got our patient experience reports, I would have killed for a dual board. I would, I would, you know, if I had the power that we have here now to understand emotions behind what people are telling us, uh, you know, we did so many things with the best intentions, but we were just not solving. We were not solving the problem and we didn't see the result. Um, go electronic and go real time. Uh, keep the lag time from discharge to survey as short as possible. Um, I know some place, some people have a six week. We have a week turnaround max for patients. Uh, if you discharge on Sunday, you're going to get that survey on Monday. Um, so some people are really short. Some the maximum is a week, but the power in that is it's fresh. It's still fresh in people's minds, and they're more willing to share that feedback. Six weeks down the track, I'm over it. Unless I really hated it or I really loved it, I'm not going to be too keen to fill it out. That's my understanding of that. Um, and don't talk stats to clinics, to, to frontline staff. Talk people. Make it relatable. It's about empathy and, and help them understand what is the emotional impact behind what happened. Super, and what that experience was. And I think they're, they're fantastic takeaways for, for people to think about, you know, if you're starting with manual, embrace the digital, and um, thinking about people uh, from a binary black and white sentiment to, to kind of go in full yeah. definition for, for emotion. And then as, as Jeffrey said, we all like getting the net promoter score increases, but that's the outcome, right? And, and thinking purely as the patients as pushing your numbers up, it's probably the wrong way to think about it. And yep. as, as Jeffrey said, how do you, it's not really about the data, it's about the decisions that you can make from the data. And I think the, the wonderful story that Jeffrey shared about how you bring that to life to the front, the, the, the frontline clinicians and um, bring those emotions and share those, of course, um, the nurses are, and, and the frontline staff are gonna to respond to that because their, their nature is by default at the curve for, for mm -hmm. people. So yeah. when, when those stories come to life, it, it really has an impact. So maybe Absolutely. just uh, maybe conclude by um, thanking um, Jeffrey for taking time. We, we, had, we had built in some time for uh, questions and answers, Jeffrey, but uh, we've actually taken an hour. But uh, I think the, <laughs> the majority of, of the great questions, um, I think you, you would have covered. And what I'll do is maybe offer anyone who is attending, if there's any questions, we can connect you directly and you can answer them. Um, happy to I help, happy to answer any questions. Super, well look, um, thanks again for your patience and your, your attentiveness during this webinar and looking forward to speaking to you in the coming days and weeks. Thanks again, cheers now. Thank Bye -bye. you, take care everyone. Yeah. Uh,